right. Hello, Martin here, and I am here with Josh Gary. Today we are on Lifestyles of the Hip and Sustainable. <laughs> we are visiting his new homestead here in uh, Lapa Hoi Hoi. Lapa Hoi Hoi. On the Big and, Island. On the Big Island. Yes. And uh, for those of you who are fans of shipping container construction, stay tuned. We have that here as well. So um, take it away, Gary. What's, what was the vision that prompted you to get started here? Um, well, I just kind of thought that growing your own food is uh, an exciting thing to do that is, you know, I don't know, living off grid is one of the most anti-war things you can do, I think. And not to be all anti-war oriented, because I'm more pro things than anti things, but um, the more I read, the more I learned, the more I searched my heart, I guess. It was like I wanted to get out of the city and uh, that guy Ralph Finney down in Los Angeles talking about growing your own food is like printing your own money. I fully believe it. I really think, you know. Especially I, avocados here, they're sort of a currency. Oh, uh, to themselves. you know, it's, it's amazing how much stuff grows here if mm. you know how to do it. And I'm trying to learn as I go. You know, I don't have a lot of spare time at the moment because I'm still trying to build. We got this amazing property, this amazing view, and uh, we're just so blessed to be here, but it is going to take a lot of work oh, to... Here comes the black ball shop. Yeah, I know. Yeah. They found me already. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a lot of work to rehabilitate. This is an old sugarcane plantation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's covered in this voracious guinea grass right now. I'm working on making that a, a resource somehow other than cattle feed. Um, but in the meantime, here's the place. Two big 40-foot shipping containers. Whoa, don't look out. Back up and get the... Yeah, uh, yeah, get the doors. This is my private door. I work for several months on these myself, these giant sliders. I remember we didn't know the... we needed these until we were here and saw how hard the wind hits them. But there's a big slab under there and the two big shipping containers. And um, we did the rail system to get these things to work properly and do what we needed them to do. And they're working quite well. Oh, go on in. And as you can see inside, we've got this Huge atrium space. It's kind of jammed with all of our stuff right now. We're living, we're living in here until we get the main house built right over yonder. But uh, yeah, it's it's been really fun. It's good, you know, a good adventure. There's a lot of uh, adjustments. So you when, know, when last we met in person, you were still living in Berkeley. That's right. And uh, and I remember you were talking about learning plumbing and things, and with an eye toward building your own place at some point. Indeed, I did. I, I, I had already had plans at that point. To, uh, I think we might have even had plans to sell our home. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I was in it, but if I was talking about taking night classes, you know, I took some classes in, um, you know, residential electrical and plumbing. Uh, I didn't end up using a whole lot of that, but I have worked around here for a lot of different construction crews before we started building this. And ever since, I've just been the foreman, you know, working in conjunction with a general contractor at times and a plumber at times and an electrician at times. Had to hire those people. There was no way around it um, other than to do everything below the table. And uh, certainly the county of Hawaii gives people quite enough reason to try to do that. They make it so very hard to build out here. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I shouldn't down them too much, actually. It's been a fairly easy process, I would say. There's, you know, some tooth gnashing at times, but um, for the most part, you know, you follow things, we go by the book, and, you know, things are working out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we got this up, and it's all signed off. You know, the inspectors came and, you know, did their thing. So, yeah, we cut one, two, three, four windows in each container and two human doors in each container. The, the big doors out front still work, but they will remain closed most of the time. We've got this atrium space, makeshift kitchen, and a mm -hmm. uh, propane fired uh, range, a propane powered dryer. And um, yeah, I mean, we have to keep the food locked away. There's no way to keep critters out of this atrium space completely, at least not yet. I'm still working on keeping rain out when it comes and hits us at 50 yeah. miles an hour completely sideways. I, I was on mop and broom duty pushing it back out this way for a week and a half when it was blasting us. So you got, uh, I noticed you got corrugated, is that corrugated steel or? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. corrugated yeah. steel. With okay. some uh, plastic clear story light? Or? Yeah, well, I decided to you know, do okay. some clear to let some more light in. Mm -hmm. you know, of course the solar panels are housed on there and uh, we've got all the utilities in this container on the ocean side here. 
Um, we, okay. didn't, we didn't finish this out in any way. We left it just raw and utilitarian. Mm -hmm. you know, and we've got, the, we've got some pretty nice inverters in this big bank of Aquion saltwater batteries, which oh. we're still seeing and how well they work. Salt water batteries. Yeah, you it's know, the they're not toxic. And the biggest uh, upside to them is that they can be drained on to zero and not be hurt. Um, really? Yeah, lead acid batteries they don't like and that. lithium ion and lithium ion apparently. You gotta keep them up above like eighty percent or something or they get hurt. And that's kinda silly because you can only use the top twenty percent, right? Right. When I was in high school I had a an S V forty eight uh, Sebring Sebring Vanguard electric car and it had eight lead acid batteries. Oh my god. And then you got discharged too. Well, and it was sad. Yeah, was sad. exactly. <laughs> so these apparently don't um, feel any harm when that happens. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know, once you step, there's stuff okay. everywhere. And we've got a backup generator here. We've got the six kilowatt inverters. Dual. The, it's Outback Power. So this is yeah. an Australian system or? Yes. Wow. Yes, indeed. And most people out here swear by it. Okay. Um, We've seen some that have been set up for 20 years. So that's your inverter and storage regulator, and it's feeding from the solar panels up above? Yeah, we've got 18 yeah. panels on the south facing roof, and uh, so it's bringing in as much power as it can at all times, and mm -hmm. uh, converts it from uh, DC to AC as we need it. Yeah, it's and fantastic. We've been running a lot of backup generator though, because sometimes the sun doesn't shine for days, if not weeks. It can, it can mm -hmm. really be like that. So, backup diesel generators is pretty beefy too. That's an eight kilowatt diesel generator. Wow. Maritime deal. Yeah, and I'm learning, you know, how to maintain mm -hmm. it because, you know, that stands in between us and the Stone Age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, and we, we run it and I'm logging the hours and you got to make sure you change the oil enough. This is the water pressure. You've got 15,000 gallons right outside. And we're catching that from the roof as well with gutters. So do you have a well also or just the rain catchment? So just that 15,000 tank. Okay. There are no utilities up on this hill mm -hmm. unless you got tens of thousands to bring mm -hmm. up power poles. And who would do that anyway? Why would you ruin your view with wires? Right, right, right. So and we've got Absolutely. some filtration. I actually brought this rig from Berkeley. Um, mm -hmm. But this came with the new rig and that's uh, ultraviolet. People out here are very concerned oh. about rat lung worm disease and slugs okay. with that disease getting into your water. So mm -hmm. this is blasting UV rays at it and for what so it's, it's worth. Alternative to chlorine. Yes, indeed, so indeed. You know, I'm not a huge fan of irradiating things either, but in this case, well, you know, take my chances with that rather than with the rat lung worm. EM spectrum radiation. As right. Opposed to, it's uh, not <laughs> micro. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, at the moment, this is just, you know, crammed with off, um, eventually there will be a house, a family home right over outside the door here, you know, 50 feet away. This will feed that water and electricity. That's the plan anyhow. Yeah. So this is kind of like the utility module. Or yes, exactly. Well, this will be the shop. I mean, I'll, I'm going to have, a, you know, a workbench and my tools and, um, you know, obviously you know, all the utilities have to stay in here. This is a very important first thing. I remember uh, talking to some people in Finland one time and they said the homesteading there, the first thing you build is the sauna. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> the sauna. It's, Absolutely, you got to take... And that's not quite the priority here in Hawaii. you got to take care of business <laughs> though, I mean, and you really do. I mean, that's why we, you know, I'm glad I thought I had a little bit here. And we, When we did this slab, we put in a four inch drain pipe running underneath it out to the septic out there, which is buried. Mm -hmm. That's the vent for it. And we have this all on a line here in this atrium space. We've got a utility sink. There's our water supply. Mm -hmm. And we've got this shower stall that we built with local, locally sourced eucalyptus, rainbow eucalyptus. I may have even shoved a, a couple of these across the planer because I worked right. at the planing mill where this came out of. <laughs> a guy named Hal Browner is a master lumber man. I mean, mm -hmm. he, people bring in trees and it comes out looking like this stuff. And so, yeah, we've got the, a, a toilet and a shower. And my shower is one of the, you know, objects of pride and joy. I've never made a shower all myself. And this is the first one. And uh, is that melted glass uh, accents in the floor there? Or? It's just little glass beads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just pushed them in when we did the floor pan. Obviously, I'm not terribly happy with that. The guy that helped me with this, it's all cracked. You know, I, I'm not going to blame him a whole lot. There was no walls here at the time. The wind was mm -hmm. whipping, so it's really hard when it dries too fast on top. 
But yeah, recycled pieces that I cut out of the containers, out of the windows. Oh, right, that's the yeah. same stuff. The okay. same yeah. stuff, just put it right back <laughs> up. And, um, you know, it's got a nice open feeling. Of course, it was feeling a little too open, so we did mm-hmm. add a you know, curtain rod. Okay. But other than that, you know, it's really rustic and it's, it's awesome. And um, at first I had this um, on-demand electric water heater, a box about this big out mm-hmm. there. And I thought we were going to use that, and it just draws way too much power at one time. Power as opposed to gas, so it was yeah, electric. yeah, it's electric. You know, I, I heavily invested in harvesting electricity from the sun, right, right. <laughs> and I did not want another propane tank, yet another propane tank that you got to keep refilling. Yeah, um, you know, and of course, most people use on-demand propane here. We will be using on-demand propane for the house over there for everything for the oven. Mm-hmm. You know, and we do have some propane tanks here already for our temporary oven and our dryer and stuff. But for the hot water heater, you know, it's only a temporary situation where everybody's showering in here. You know, mm-hmm. this is more like the farmer's shower when you're done working. You know, you want to hose off before you even go in the house. <laughs> but so you know, so even though we got rid of that um, on-demand water heater, I still insisted stubbornly that we should have electricity heating our water and that may have been a very stupid thing to say and do but we have this 20 gallons it heats it with electricity at a slower pace and it's been working out but we have to Mm -hmm. watch that switch we shut it off at the breaker box all the time because it's it sucks a lot of if we have a hundred percent of energy you know which is i don't know how many watts it's written down there kilowatts um this will put a big chunk in it. You know, we turn it on at the right time when it's time to take a shower and then we turn it off again. I've been taking lukewarm showers or even cold showers the next day sometimes to make sure that mm-hmm. my family has enough water for heat, you know, uh-huh. enough hot water. So, you know, these little things are adjustments and not permanent ones at that. So, um, you know, no, one of the projects we'll I did in the past was to put a uh, solar hot water system on a house I had in Portland. Yes. And that was a, that was a fun project. I just saw it at an Earth Day um, display and decided, heck, I can do that. And so I went and learned how to braze copper tubes and all nice. that stuff. Nice. Nice. Right on. <laughs> and it did keep uh, you know, Some nice people do have them. Tank. Some people do have them here. It's been deal. suggested to me. However, the rental that we were in had that. And it's unreliable. Again, when the sun doesn't yeah. shine for you, you still days and days. The backup. <coughs> electric, but we found that uh, exactly. with our south-facing hillside in right. Portland, we were in the summer. We pretty much had the solar hot water all the time, and then, right. of course, in the winter time, <laughs> it was the reverse. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you know, I mean, keeping hot water on hand is you know a real challenge when you're living mm-hmm. off grid. I I know that for a fact now. I've learned, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm not even going to say how much money I've spent on the solar system, but it's a lot. It was mm-hmm. a lot, almost all of my money. Um, after we got the land, obviously, mm-hmm. and um, it's you know I I don't know if the technology is not there yet, but um, we're still working to get the most bang for our buck out of these batteries and inverters, mm-hmm. and um, you know, as as con- as as you know, beings of convenience, we have no idea how much energy we use. It's just not part of our thought process until you do mm-hmm. something like this, and then you're watching every little watt. It's sort of like if you, uh, you know, ask uh, teenagers to power their iPhones off of a, uh, a generator on a bicycle for a uh, while. You, know, you got it. I'm telling or, you. Or TV. You know? I, I made sure <laughs> that you can hook other things into this system. And we've got a ton of wind up here. So mm-hmm. I've been watching videos about how to make a vertical axis wind turbine because that seems mm-hmm. to be the fastest way, the cheapest way to make something that actually works without spending $80,000 dollars on a windmill That's and how um, the uh, earth yeah. ships in, in New Mexico were set up uh, dual wind and solar exactly feeding into the same and I, I keep on telling my sons you know I'm gonna get an extra cycle hooked up and if they want to watch TV <laughs> you got to get me five miles or something you know at least squeak out a couple of volts for me coach dad exactly you know I want to keep them in shape so that's that'd be a good way I'd love to do that myself I mean the more the merrier the more Absolutely. ways you can harvest some electricity you know I I'm a real big proponent of free energy and I also like to keep it real though and say you know the energy is free but harvesting it is not you must <laughs> do something <laughs> quiet as it's kept you need yeah. an investment in time and energy and and usually money so yeah here we are and uh, it's you know this this atrium space once it's unloaded of all of this material stuff it has incredible acoustics and so mm-hmm. I you know as as far as music making is concerned once the family is actually living over there 
I'll be very excited to hear some band jamage happening here. <laughs> and of course, in here, the other container, the south container, we uh, we did frame it out with two by fours and we did um, insulate it heavily because we realized first and foremost that the sun hit, you know, even with the roof over this whole thing, sun hits this south wall all day long and it heats up like a frying pan. You literally sizzle mm -hmm. your finger on it. And um, okay. so that wasn't gonna work. And especially with an eye towards the future, this, you know, hopefully being a recording and rehearsal jam studio, want it soundproof both ways, keep sound out, keep sound in. Um, right. But it's the same with the heat. We wanna keep heat out um, or keep heat in. Uh, now that we're learning how cold it gets in the winter at night here, mm -hmm. I mean, at least this winter, not, I mean, this is far colder than the last two winters we've been here, far. And a lot of people talk about, you know, weather cycles in terms of five years. And some things, you know, there's mm -hmm. always the 50 year storm is coming or the, the 500 year storm is coming. So, but anyway, um, insulating this was a good idea and you can tell mm -hmm. how you know dense the sound is in here yeah that's and, it. and you know the walls nice. don't get hot it stays plenty cool when it's hot out and it stays plenty warm when it's cold out and um you know the way i painted it <coughs> my wife said it looks like a recording studio i said good because <laughs> <'Cause laughs> will be. for the moment it's 10 feet of master bedroom and 10 feet of office space and 10 feet of living room space and 10 feet of the boys room essentially in the big shop. It's 40 uh, feet long. Four eight by 10 rooms in a, in a shipping container. Basically, yeah, you know, and we got the windows and yeah. I mean, it's really cozy. I'm, I'm, I'm digging it. I'm totally digging it, you know, mm -hmm. and as far as like, you know, <laughs> a little privacy here and another curtain over there for our bed. And I remember seeing some of the pictures on Facebook of Daniel and Jackson looking so happy at the completion of this part and that part of this structure and thinking, well, Wow, dad and mom built the fort, and they had to come up with this. Too. Exactly, <laughs> you know, it really is. It's sort of, you know, and I, I'm the first to admit this is sort of like a man-sized fort, and you know, it's fun, you know, and I, I want them to experience the adventure and uh, hopefully take pleasure in it. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's all I can hope for, really. Um, besides all the fresh air, and yeah. it certainly is a beautiful place to live. The weather can be dry. I mean, it's, it's... Well, why don't we take a look as long as it's not raining at the moment. Just exactly. Just to get a, see the spread of the land. Absolutely. I, I, the beautiful ocean out there. Yeah. yeah, we've got nearly 180 mm -hmm. degrees of fresh ocean view. We're up at 900 feet elevation. You got to learn so what grows and what doesn't. Hawaiian culture, there is there are directional names for down towards the shore and up absolutely up, uh, yeah. up, to the, up the hill towards the mountain top yeah <laughs> mauka and makai mauka and makai is mauka's up, is up the, the hill makai's mauka down to the ocean is up uh, in toward mauna kea in this case right yep in <laughs> fact on a really clear day the tip of mauna kea is we think right behind these trees uh -huh. um you can okay. you can see part of it you can't quite see the snow cap there. but it would be yeah it'd be <laughs> right up there and it goes on and on and on i mean it's a really long gradual mountain you yeah. know, I mean, miles and miles, it's probably 10 miles to the to the peak, at least, if not 20. I'm not sure. Yeah. But and let's see, you're probably at what, one or 2,000 feet here? Or? We're at 900 feet. 900 feet. 900 feet elevation. So that's a, another 12,000 feet up. <laughs> yeah. Top of Mount Akira. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it just goes on. But we've got this, mm -hmm. you know, just beautiful sweeping pastoral land. And it goes in both directions. It's sort of a, a, a strip a along the mountainside. Here, or What's that? A few acres then? Or? 12. 12. Acres running in a strip mm -hmm. down to Mono Viopi Stream, which you can sort of see the hint of gulch there. It's a deep one. When you get to the edge of our property, that's the top of an embankment that goes down, uh, you know, 500, 1,000 feet. Oh, majorly, yeah. It's, it's the, the, the stream itself has got to be 300 feet straight down mm -hmm. from where you stand when you get all the way down this. And this goes down, you know, close to a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's it's park sized. I haven't, we haven't even w walked the entire land. We walked the perimeter twice when we bought it. And you know, the last year we've been building and not keeping the guinea grass cut back. So look at this wall. I mean, you can't really tell from here, but that's all easily six feet tall, if not taller as you go down. Now, one and of the things we, we saw at the uh, permaculture place we visited today was that they were using uh, sheep 
I thought they were goats oh, yeah. because they were shorn. <laughs> I'm not yeah, used yeah. to shorn sheep. You gotta keep you gotta keep their hair really <laughs> short or they get they get too hot here. And yeah. they get pesty. They get oh, oh, okay. yeah, people have warned me so about they that. Were, they had the sheep at work keeping the vegetation at bay. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if you don't have a budget for a tractor, which we don't, <laughs> donations are gladly accepted. Um we don't have a budget for a tractor or a riding mower yet, and you know I'm out there with a weed whip killing myself trying to keep it back. Um, we do have this fence. We just got this installed. It's not even quite done yet, but it's a new perimeter fence just around this this hilltop bluff that I am toying with calling Area 42 or the domestic compound or something like that. Um, but this is in order to get somebody's cows back on here as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We've had them on before. In fact, there were cows here when we got the land. They'd, the cows had lived here longer than us. I see. But um, that guy pulled his cows, and you can see what happens when you've got nothing eating. Um, this stuff just goes and goes. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. you know, you, you've seen houses that are completely overtaken by this stuff. You know, they're yeah. abandoned. You it's like, like the animal unit month abbreviation. A-U-M. <laughs> yeah, right. Aum. Well, yeah, I mean, have a big mouthful of Aum because we need to get some cows back on here eating and pooping and uh, helping us, you know, rehabilitate this land and uh, get ready to start planting some stuff. I want to concentrate on trees. It's already been advised to me, you know, the more edible stuff you grow on trees, the less weeding you have to do. It so, makes a lot of sense. Macadamia nuts, citrus, uh, avocados, you, all, all you, of the above. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and whatever else we can get away with. I mean, you know, a lot of the fruits that we're used to on the mainland won't grow here. They're mm -hmm. thin-skinned stuff that need crisper, colder weather. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Apples and pears and peaches and lots of things that I would love to see grow here. Probably will not, but, you know, it just takes experimentation. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of stuff that, that does. and. Um, you know, sticking with the tried and true, there's nothing wrong with that. You can live off these other fruits and get used to them. There's guava trees down in, in our little gulch, just over that way, and they're completely edible. They're wonderful. So, yep, that's where we are right now. I mean, we're standing right in about where the master bedroom of the family house will uh, hopefully soon be, about a year from now. And uh, like I said, the shipping container garage will feed this house electricity and water over there. We've got all that utility stuff already in place. We've got a septic tank out here big enough for five toilets, I think. So a little room to grow. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the uh, water the system tank or the rain catchment rain tank. tank? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, fifteen thousand gallons of rainwater, and we filter it and. Um, it's 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 wonderful. I you know I've got no no problems with it. I drank it once before we were filtering it, and I got sick as a dog. Sure enough, um, but it also made me wonder: Have I gone through a rite of passage? If I kept <laughs> drinking it at that point, would I have been okay? Yeah. Well, I'll never know because we decided to. <laughs> I didn't want my kids to go through that or my wife. So we decided to turn on that UV filter. And um, anyway, you know, we're learning as we go, all sorts of stuff, um, you know, to get used to. Uh, the weather is intense. I mean, it's like, it's either maximum rain or maximum sun or maximum wind or, you know, all three at the same time sometimes, you know, or all three in the same day. It's now, amazing. Is that any different up here at 900 feet than it is down by the water or is it? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, it's, it's you can drive for 10 miles and go through a sheet of heavy, heavy rain and all of a sudden it's over and it's sunny, you know. Mm -hmm. And so those those sort of microclimates, you know, float around the island. I mean, in the, at the halfway point in Waimea, um, it really is sort of like the land of the light and the land of the dark. They've got the wet side and the and the and the dry side of Waimea. It cuts right through the top, the town there. Oh, wow. And, but yeah, out here, I mean, Hamakua Coast is known for rain. There's a lot of rain. So, you know, we get a lot of rain throughout the year, and uh, I guess right now it could be considered the rainy season being winter. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's much colder than it was the last two winters, so I'm still learning what to, you know, what it could be. We, uh, yesterday or the day before, we drove up uh, the saddle road out of Hilo to the west. And, yeah. And we're just kind of enjoying that nice, easy drive up that new freeway. Um, but noticing there's not a lot happening once you get a three four miles away from the shore 
Oh yeah, it's like uh, moon. I, it's, it's like you're driving across the moon it's, in some it's places. It's the though. desert part of the island. Yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. getting into. Oh, you get you over the Kona side too. Not develop that because it's is it state park or is it? Oh, a uh, lot of it is a lot of it is state park owned. Um, I'm really not sure. I mean, up there is where the you know military training grounds are and all sorts of you know kind of oh, wow. secret off limits places are up so, there. Yeah, where Edward Snowden used to work, maybe. No, he was on the other island. He, well, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there is you know some talk about you know what goes on up there if they're mm-hmm. you know they deny using depleted uranium now but there's still depleted uranium rounds up there and uh, mm-hmm. you know being disturbed by new training I mean I think why, they've got an entire like Afghan they, village up there that they use for you know pretending to kill bin Laden or whatever oh my god I'm not kidding you that's, but that's wild. you would think they have a whole bombing range island to themselves what is it the <laughs> Leno what is the name of the island oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. right there is one There's of them one. one of them that they uh, like since you. World War II has been designated solely for military you, you know you do see military they helicopters trash that come by. so bad they don't want to use it anymore yeah <laughs> for that. I know well see you know and, and you know the, the whole idea is that we're going to be good stewards of the land and mm-hmm. you know um, at every turn there is a, a temptation not to you know, I mean, it, like this guinea grass, this stuff you know, is unbelievable. And most, a lot, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people spray. You know, they use mm-hmm. the Monsanto products to get rid of it. And yeah, exactly. It just makes me sort of tense up and be like, I can't go there. I just, no matter, it's not an option for me. I Here just we are couldn't in possibly do that. Iris is the eyeball of the world, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, let's dump some poison. Jefferson's once compared the Pacific Ocean to the the lens of the eye of the earth staring out into space interesting not paying really any attention to humanity just looking out there you know? <laughs> well I, I feel like there must be some ley line energy on in hawaii um it's almost like the gravity is stronger or something to me it, it's really an, an, an interesting feeling but whatever the case i mean we're newcomers here and, and we did come to try to live off the land so you know you know you don't shit where you eat <laughs> <laughs> Especially when that's the only land that is yeah. in existence for thousands of miles in any direction. <laughs> and we chose Hamakua Coast because there's so much dirt. I mean, there, this dirt goes down. It does? Yeah. There's a how, lot of how dirt. How far does this? Six, eight feet at least. Wow. Okay. So some places are lucky to have a couple of inches of dirt well, before you hit the volcanic rock. Yeah, we enjoyed seeing the, uh, the lava. Two, not, two evenings ago. Sure. Did you, so go, did you go through we, a lava we, tube or anything we, like that? We, well, not, not, in, not nothing active like that, but earlier in the day we did go see a uh, sort of like a cavern that was left of a tube. Well, that's what I mean. Where the lava had flown. Had Over by the Kona Airport? Um, this is down oh, by the, um, Kona side, huh? the eastern tip where there's a lighthouse structure there old steel lighthouse huh, i'm not even and sure there's I've just seen a whole it. field of lava around there with a little bit of vegetation neat <laughs> yeah no and there's uh, there's a great one over by the, near the kona airport on the other mm-hmm. side huge tunnel and big caverns and you can always see people stopped and taking pictures and so is is the fifteen thousand gallon tank is it all pretty much above ground oh, on, yeah. on another one of your cement pads here yeah that's, that's a cement ring. ring it's just a ring. ring oh okay with a bunch of gravel in the middle okay and yeah it was a it was an interesting day to watch this, you know, this team come and assemble that. Yet another thing that I could take no part in other than writing checks. Um, <laughs> nor would I have wanted to. I mean, this is so specialized. But yeah, I mean, they, they knock this thing up and they put this big liner in and they bring, you know, 5,000 gallons of water um, just to settle the liner into place. Mm, so okay. they start you off with that much. Um, so far, water use has not been a problem. It's mm-hmm. all about energy. Do we have enough electricity to do this, that, and the other today? Mm-hmm. You know, but we haven't run out of water. It does happen. I've been told. Um, doesn't rain for a long time, and all of a sudden you're stuck. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, you either get some jugs and go down to a free county water supply, or you pay somebody to bring a water truck up and give you a fill. Take a vacation or whatever. It takes. Exactly. Exactly. So, so you got the rain gutters on the uh, on both sides. Yes, the, yes, the, the catch as much as we possibly that can. White tube, yeah, and then that feeds in that what feeds. over to there. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, as long as the roof is higher than the catchment tank, is what I was told. It okay. will all fill naturally with no power, just that gravity. Makes sense. Okay. And so we're catching the rain, and it, keeps the it joins together there and comes underground here. I dug this cruise myself as quickly as humanly possible. The day that the gutter people came and informed me they don't do any trenching. And I was like, ah, somebody could have well, told me that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, I got the shovel out. 
Um, so yeah, they and you know connect the plumbers connected this up, and then yeah, I mean as it's filling, there's an overflow on the other side, and then this is bringing water back into the system under the same, under the same trench. It's a little obscured here by my scraps, but it goes that's where it's entering. Tank there. It goes in, yeah, it goes into the that wall inside there. First stop is the uh, pressure pump. And which you know jams it up into the pressure tank at pressure and then you know from there it heads out into the pressurized system it goes through some filtration and for now it's only going to the shower toilet and sink on the inside of this atrium mm -hmm. but later on we'll take a draw off it at that corner or run it this way from from the trench or whatever no it's gonna have to come after the pressurization it may have to come from inside and poke back out but whatever we're gonna have another long trench going between the garage and the main house and so the pressurized system will extend further into the other house and i'm told that that little pump is good enough to do it all we'll see we haven't crossed that bridge yet sounds great is there anything else about the infrastructure project that we should know that we haven't uh covered so far well i don't know the day the day that these containers were delivered up here is a day i shall not soon forget it was raining everything Everything becomes extremely treacherous driving when it rains. And to get this gravel road right took us three tries or something, thousands of dollars. We watched some of our gravel wash away days after we installed it. Um, you have to crown roads, you have to make sure the water can go somewhere else or you have <laughs> created a river is what you've done if you don't and do it right. Soon you have a ravine to drive through. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. Anyway, so even as it was, uh, we got these trucks up here, huge trucks with uh, scissor lifts that took them off sideways. Oh. Um, but they weren't going to make it all the way up here themselves. Thank God we had our um, excavator, there's a giant excavator over here doing the septic and that guy helped us out by using the arm of the excavator. We got the, the trucks delivering these containers up as far as they could go and sort of beached them like whales. We said, well, you're gonna get stuck right there, so you may as well just get stuck right there. Mm -hmm. And we hooked the chains on and we watched and this guy. Across he the dragged the these giant trucks, wow. you know, 100 feet or something, <laughs> right in a position here and then, bzz, you know, they come off with the hydraulic thing, That's they right. got these little joysticks. Unbelievable precision how well they can place them on the slab, you know. So little when building with shipping containers, you really have to pay attention to the last mile or the last yard problems. It's oh man, <laughs> I, I you know, it was it was a really stressful, anxiety filled day, but mm -hmm. to watch it all come together and get placed was a moment of triumph for us all. And we're standing in the pouring rain going, Yeah, we got it. and he actually dragged them back out onto the road again around this way so they could leave. Ah. And, uh, you know, another day we uh, just to actually to pour that little spillway on the on the road, um, the concrete truck did something I didn't ask him to do. And he, he cut a corner right there, and even though it was dry, his tires sank in, oh, boof, wow. like three feet. He was wow. stuck. He was at a 45 degree angle. We had to offload all the cement by hand. Wow. It was a rough day. That was another really rough day, and the, we had to get a guy to come up here and rescue us. Basically, bring a tractor and yeah, pull him out the cement someplace where the rain's not pouring out. Well, you, well <laughs> it wasn't raining, thankfully, but uh, he got stuck in, in the dirt and uh, we, could, we couldn't get him unstuck until we unloaded it and we couldn't unload it until we shoveled it all off of there. Mm -hmm. That was a hard, you know, what should have been a 30 minute pour was an eight hour ordeal. But you know, right. thankfully, you know, you know, these things happen and uh, it's all been a great learning process. It's a beautiful place to live. I can't wait to get started on the house. Um, but yeah, I can't, you know, I'm in a point in my life where I can't wait to wake up every morning, you know, and that's such a different feeling than working a desk job that I, you know, oh, didn't yeah. enjoy very much. Of course, I'm making no money right now. I'm working absolutely for free. Um, I've spent my entire life savings on this and um, the pressure to turn a dollar is certainly starting to loom. You mm -hmm. know, and you know, people rent out their land to sweet potato farmers and get paid for that just to sit there and own land. However, those sweet potato farmers will use pesticides and they uh. will, they will, you know, trial your, you know, land down instead of across, you know, mm -hmm. 
which will wash all your soil away. I'll, I've, I've had all these kind of warnings at least. So you have to be very picky and choosy about who you're going to let do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, uh, I keep telling myself as well as anybody else that's willing to listen that uh, my goal is to need money less. You right. know, it may well, not I be remember, possible uh, to need money not at all, but uh, to need money less is to feel a lot richer. My favorite scene in uh, Michael Reynolds, he's the architect that developed the earth ships made out of tires and cans. And yes, I've and watched things. a video on him. Uh, he describes what it feels like to wake up in a house that feeds you rather than you feeding it. Yeah. And not having a loan or a mortgage on it. I know. Um, and having the food growing in the greenhouse attached to it. And just, Absolutely. And just thinking, wow, I'm completely free. What do I want to do today? Yes, you know? <laughs> indeed. Well, you so, know, so that's the goal, right? Yeah, and, and, then the, and then the wife will tell you, here's a list of the things you need to do today <laughs> to keep this, you know, earth ship running. Right, you know, right. it really is. It's, you know, you've, you've, traded, uh, you've traded one kind of work for another, but, you know, hopefully it's a more um, rewarding work you know but yeah I mean you're on 24 hour watch the generator duty and watch the solar power and make sure that mm -hmm. the rain isn't getting in and your container is filling up while you sleep <laughs> you know who knows but you know um, it is it's a real adventure and there's a lot of harrowing moments and and trying times but uh, I wouldn't change it for anything I'm really excited about every single day and you know, the sooner we get some trees planted, the better as far as I'm concerned, because that's a long road. That's a five year caretaking mm -hmm. investment at least. The pigs will tear them up. Um, the mm -hmm. wind can kill them. You know, it, to get a tree to maturity is quite an accomplishment. And uh, I need to learn more okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> more to come on that. <laughs> I to get one picture of your, your uh Oh yes. Lovely toy here. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is Sunhouse Records vehicle number one. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I do go by Sunhouse on stage with my band, the Selassieites. 